um, <laughs> lovely to be here. And uh, I've been, uh, it, it was also lovely to see some familiar faces as you popped up in your little, uh, in the little boxes that we're all inhabiting at the moment. Um, I, I've been involved, as Elizabeth uh, has hinted, it, with the uh, National Deaneries Network because of my connection to Elizabeth. And she and I were both serving in uh, Tower Hamlets. Elizabeth uh, continues to live in Tower Hamlets. And uh, I wanted to, um, let me just tell you what I'm going to do, but I'm going to start in a moment with a little account of an exercise that she and I did together. Uh, we have just worked it out. It was in 2004 uh, in the Deanery of Tower Hamlets. So what I want, what I'm planning to do through the course of the evening, um, and uh, you, you can push me in different ways if you want to push me in different ways, but I, I thought I'd, I'd just outline where I think we are at the moment by, by casting us back to where Elizabeth and I were in 2004, and then to reflect on some particular issues that seem to have uh, emerged in, in various ways over the last several months. So uh, talking about the vision and strategy uh, process, about the, the, the various things that have flowed from that, uh, the save the, just touch on the Save the Parish movement, the, the, the GS2222, uh, and the context we're in. And the question I want to ask and, and to invite you to reflect on as I talk about that is what's going on what it what's underneath the sort of reaction and engagement and concerns that we have uh, in relation to the issues there and uh, then I'm going to say a bit about and my the plan is that I stop at eight o'clock and then we have a uh, breakout group so it's so this will either be before the breakout groups or after say a bit about where we are present in my view and you know, my view is both uh, local in terms of Suffolk but it's also national in terms of my role as chair of ministry council and I'm on every other committee you could possibly imagine for my sins so I, I do get to see some of the conversations and experience some of the conversations that are going on in different parts of the um, the, the church the national uh, bodies um, and I wanted then to uh, give just to end an, an illustration again from Suffolk of how we're engaging with the challenges that we're facing, which are, are sort of attempting to delineate what we think the future might look like. And to do that with reference amongst other things, but with reference to deaneries, because I think one of the things we're seeing through the processes that various dioceses are going through is that the deaneries are, as it were, the right size for some of the sorts of discussions and decisions that need to be taken. Um, and uh, so I, that's where I wanted to end up. So that gives you a little outline. So let me start with the story. Uh, Elizabeth and I um, were stirred into action and various other people in the deanery of Tower Hamlets because the archdeacon had produced a list of the parishes and uh, marked them on that list about whether whether they were viable or non-viable, um, which you can imagine produced a, a, a rather furious response from clergy and laity. And we decided that what we would rather do is to take this uh, into our own hands rather than simply let the archdeacon decide which ones we're going to close on the basis of non-viability and uh, look at the question of, uh, of vitality, were we vital or not vital? And, uh, and to, to focus in that direction, I'm, I apologize to Alistair here to, to referring to an archdeacon in perhaps not the most enthusiastic terms here, but um, I've learned better since. Uh, and so we set up a little strategy group in the deanery, which uh, um, Elizabeth and I were on, and we worked I mean, I, I think phenomenally hard to try and work out what's a sustainable pattern of, uh, of the deployment of ordained clergy um, in that deanery. As an exercise we did, 
we we made various recommendations, which included uh, closing and merging two, uh, closing one parish, merging uh, into another. Uh, we attempted to close another one, but we discovered the archdeacon had designs on it for something else. Um, uh, the bishop wanted to close another one, but we stopped him doing that. Uh, and uh, through that, uh, there was what one of the things that happened in the process was that. Uh, financially, the whole exercise turned around. And rather than, you know, we started as the, as the most dependent deanery in the whole of the Diocese of London, and we ended up getting close to supporting ourselves. So there, it, that was a good experience for us. But the interesting thing, when I uh, was reflecting with Elizabeth, was that at no point did it occur to us to look at the deployment of lay ministers. Uh, we were only focused on clergy. And in fact, I don't think we looked at the deployment of self-supporting clergy. I think we looked at stipendiary clergy. Um, so fast forwarding to uh, last year here in Suffolk, I, with uh, again with a group of people, went through an exercise to see what the deployment of ministry uh, looks like and could look like in the diocese and as we did that exercise yes we were looking at the deploy deployment of ordained uh, ministers uh, self-supporting and uh, and stipendiary but we were also looking at uh, readers licensed lay ministers licensed evangelists licensed pioneer ministers uh, family and children's workers youth workers and so forth and recognizing that the, the, the range of ministries which serve, enable, build up the body and uh, all of us in our uh, Christian life and witness, that range of ministries has expanded extraordinarily in just the last 20 years. Now, I'm I'm sure you've got very similar experiences, but I think just as a for me as a starting point, I wanted to wanted to highlight the fact that we are now when we use the word ministry and we, we there are all sorts of other uh, complications that we have about using the word ministry, because, you know, we all are called to uh, ministry by virtue of baptism. Um, so we're using here in, in a specific way in relation to particular roles and activities that are on behalf of and for the sake of the mission of the church. And when we use that word now, we use it in a much broader sense than we used it even 20 years ago. And just to kind of three, three relatively recent elements in that, which I think it would just be worth us uh, remembering. Uh, one is the whole setting God's people free process, which um, I think has been one of the most extraordinary exercises uh, in the certainly my recent memory of the life of the church, um, embraced to different extents by different dioceses. But I think where it has been embraced, it's it's you can see it's begun to make a difference. Uh, the 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 little document, tiny document that we produced in, in uh, Ministry Council uh, called Ministry for a Christian Presence, which was published as a GS MISC document, where we start out, first of all, by looking at the nature of God and uh, God in Trinity and reflecting that God in Trinity is a, is a relating and ascending God and calls us into uh, lives that are both re relate relational and being sent, and that uh, the the whole the whole uh, body of Christ, the whole people of God, are called into that relationship with God to be witnesses, to be faithful servants, to uh, be in relationship with God. So we start from start our consideration about, as it were, the more formal ministries from the ministry of the whole people of God. And out of that, then, people are, have vocations to particular 
forms of ministry. And, and so we, we delineate those, uh, but delineate them very much as um, uh, issuing from the body for the sake of the body. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that's in, you know, if you read the, the preface to the ordination service, the, fir the, 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 the first part of the ordination service, that makes that pl pl blatantly clear. So we've started doing ordination services starting at the font and uh, renewing baptismal vows as the beginning of that service. So, so just to get to remind us that that's the foundation and that we are all called. So, so that, that little document, uh, Ministry for a Christian Presence, spells uh, some of that out. And then some of you may have uh, seen uh, more recently in, in the last year or so, Kingdom Calling, which is a um, Faith and Order Commission document, which uh, uh, is a really, I, I, th I think it's a really challenging and exciting uh, exploration of the theology of lay ministry. And uh, it, it does that in a way that, that, that looks at the context, particularly the, the secularized context in which we are, and looks at the sorts of things that have inhibit our embrace of the calling that God places on each one of us. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the secular context is part of that, but so is our failure of uh, theological imagination. Um, and so just challenging is in various ways to expand our understanding of, of, of God and what God is calling us to. So, so that, um, that's a kind of just, just a, for me, it's a, a helpful reminder to say that we've actually come quite a distance. And that does rather indicate a direction of travel that I think we need to, we need to be taking really seriously. And of course, all the language about discipleship is uh is is language about what is the calling of the whole people of god and and how do we deepen uh that calling and i see a, a request to put the documents up if i can uh when i take a breath in a moment i will i will uh put them up on the chat um so into this then comes a strat vision and strategy exercise led by stephen cottrell uh where he made a very uh, deliberate uh, intention to uh, listen to uh, a wide range of voices uh, and particularly to young voices and particularly to uh, uh, a diversity of backgrounds, uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds, uh, economic, social backgrounds and so forth. So went through a, a listening process, uh, not this summer, just gone the previous summer, and it was out of that that we got um, the, the, the little mantra, simpler, humbler, bolder, which I think is something that, that, that people have picked up on and it resonates. We, we, we get a set, we're not quite sure what it means, but we get a sense that it means something really important. So let's pay attention to it. So, so that struck, I think, a, a, a really positive chord with people. Um, uh, and then the 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 three uh, the areas in which um, the the listening process uh, produced some uh, kind of focal points for a strategic direction, which had to do with um, the uh, growing uh, younger and more diverse, uh, had to do with mixed ecology, and had to do with being missionary disciples. Um, and it was out of that that some of these uh, bold figures emerged about having 10,000 new uh, Christian communities, about 30,000 leaders with, uh, for working with children and young people, and about 3,000 churches uh, focused on um, active young disciples. Um, now, I, part of this is about, uh, I mean, it's certainly ambitious. Part of it is about presentation. And at one point in this exercise, I was trying to encourage us to, to, to be able to look at these sorts of numbers as uh, in relation to what is existing at present. Because um, one of the things, you know, a, a previous goal that we, the church gave itself um, was, um, uh, but which I think we believe was 
as it were, we were inspired to give ourselves was the goal to increase the number of ordinands by 50%. Now, in a diocese like this, uh, increasing the number of ordinands uh, of, uh, by 50% could, was something we could say, oh, yeah, OK, that, that sounds a really good idea. We can do that. I mean, I think it meant increasing from four to six. Um, now, I know other dioceses have, uh, have uh, much higher figures, and we now have much higher figures. But it was, a, it was an achievable aspiration. And one of the, the challenges about, you know, having, for instance, 10,000 new Christian communities is what... I mean, you know, I, I do try and do the sum in my head and think, well, that's, you know, however many hundred that's got to be in Suffolk. I mean, I have enough trouble with the ones I've got. Um, so so you, 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 you trying to get a, a kind of realistic perspective, what actually is meant by this is part of the challenge. And I think one of the reasons that, that some of these ambitious and rightly ambitious targets have been uh, so, uh, so, uh, criticized is because they are they don't they don't Im, don't seem to emerge from the context of what we understand and what we're familiar with um uh, and so I, I i i think it's part of what's been going on now of course that that whole thing was then compounded by the emergence of the the so-called myriad project uh john mcginley's comments about um uh people like me being a limiting factor um, the 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 then we've we've had the emergence of the save the parish um, movement, uh, which has then latched on to as I said to the the um, the the green paper a discussion and consultation paper, which was um, endorsed for discussion by General Synod in July, on the uh, revision of the mission and pastoral measure. Um, so all of that's been going on. We sometimes forget that we have been in the most appalling pandemic as well. Um, and that, uh, so part of my question when I ask us, what is it that, um, what's been really going on is what, th th there's a sort of febrile atmosphere, and this is not just in the church, it's in all sorts of quarters, um, that is, uh, seems to have emerged from our, our our kind of coming feeling we're coming out a little bit of this current uh, situation, but not being so sure about how well we're coming out of it. Um, so so a, a, a real sense of anxiety, a huge sense of exhaustion, um, a, a profound sense of loss and grief. Um, and so all of that is going on as well. And, uh, you know, in terms of the, the life of the church, I listen to John Spence um, remind uh, me at virtually every meeting I'm at where he's also there that um, the diocese is collectively have a, an accumulated deficit of one hundred and forty million pounds over the last three years, which is his uh, his uh, basis of his argument that we've got to we've got to do. Uh, things radically different um, because we haven't got a sustainable model at the moment. So, so that's the that's the kind of context. And that it's out of that that um, I want to ask that question: uh, What is going on? But let let me carry on a little bit and say um, a few things about what is actually happening at the moment in at the at the national level that I'm familiar with in terms of the of the life of the uh, church in relation to ministry. Um, I think one of the things where I, I would say there is a, the, the Save the Parish movement and the vision and strategy are both talking about the same thing, is where they're talking about the vital importance of local ministry. In one form or another, local ministry is crucial to the, the thriving, uh, the development, uh, the sustaining uh, of the life of the church in whatever form it is. And I, I don't uh, want to lose sight of that because 
in all of those numbers that get that get used uh, underneath that is the real sense that we are asking God to call people to work in lo- in communities with groups of people, perhaps groups of people that um, the church hasn't been engaged with uh, wholeheartedly before, uh, and to work in those contexts for the sake of proclaiming the gospel. And so there is that that sort of common ground there that I think it, it uh, I. I find helpful to use as the basis for exploration. One of the other things that's going on at the moment is a review of our theological education sector, which is partly the response to, well, no, it's entirely the response to the fact that a new funding model was introduced a few years ago and there was a commitment to review that model. But we've expanded the remit and uh, in the work we're doing on this, one of the things we're wanting to do is to is to come up with a model, a funding model that enables the training of for people for lay ministry in that same context. Um, one of the difficulties we've had at the moment is that uh, what the ordained and the lay, uh, those called to uh, those ministries, particularly licensed lay ministries, um, are not. Uh, the resources available to the ordained are not available to those training for lay ministry necessarily. Now that varies from place to place, but we want to try and build a more consistent uh, picture and a greater level of accessibility to that. The the issue of discernment is important here as well. If I can just put this in, this may may seem like a series of little disjointed comments, but I'm I'm filling my time up till eight o'clock. Um, uh, the issue of discernment is uh, is an ongoing question. What it, we, we've just changed the the model of discernment for ordained ministry, but but what should we be doing about discernment for lay ministries? Um, is it simply a question of some of, of the vicar tapping somebody on the shoulder and saying, "Do you think you would like to do this?" Um, and I know it's more than that, but are there are there ways in which we need to be um, looking at that uh, process of discernment in similar ways, not as not as elaborate, but in sim- similar sorts of ways as we do for ordained ministry. And then the other part of that is, why do we do discernment at one point and then stop? Um, actually, you know, all of us in whatever vocation we're called to, that vocation will take different shifts and turns and directions. Um, And we need to be paying attention to what God is calling us to at different stages in our lives. And can we, can we find a way to support people in that process of discernment? Um, So that's, that's another range of questions that we're looking at in the uh, context of ministry division. Um, let me just let me just finish, and then it will be time for uh, breakout groups. Um, some characteristics, and uh, Elizabeth reminded me of this: that when we were doing the exercise in Tower Hamlets, one of the things we were trying to do was to enable parishes to be much more collaborative together, working together. And she is just. Um, Uh, said to me that she's still trying to achieve that. Um, One of the words that has emerged in the the discourse about um, ministry, lay and ordained, in uh, the Church of England has been this word collaboration. And uh, the the, the sense that this is not about the vicar telling everybody what to do. This is a, a, a mutual relationship between people called to a range of of ministries, lay and ordained, working together for a common purpose. And one of the things we see, for instance, and I'll say a bit more about this after the break, but one of the things that we see here in Suffolk, and many of you will be very familiar with this, is that in large uh, rural multi-parish benefices, you need a team of people who are actually going to draw on one another for support, for wisdom, for guidance, um, 
Some have one set of skills, others have another set of skills. So how do we actually see ourselves as a body uh, where each body has a valued part to play in that? So collaboration is an important dimension of this. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning the word relational and, and deriving that from the nature of the Trinity. And, and we, we also see that, that ministry is in so many ways about relationships. One of the things that this is another whole exercise that I've been involved in, listening to dioceses, clergy, laity, um, people from a whole range of different contexts talking about um, what they value or don't value from the national church provision. And in the course of that, one of the things that really surprised me was uh, p clergy in particular were over and again saying what they really value is having a relationship with their archdeacon or the, and their bishop that they, they wanted to feel that they were known, supported, cared for, uh, and encouraged, and that, re and that relationship through which they experienced that was vital. Um, so that relationality operates in a number of different directions in the course of uh, the, the, the life and the flourishing of the church. Um, the other word, and I don't like the word, I wish we, it, it missional, it's in, in my in my vocabulary, that's not a real word. Um, uh, I'd say missionary, perhaps. But you know what I mean, um, because we use it all the time. We are in a, such a different context than we were even now. I was ordained 43 years ago when I started. We The sorts of challenges that we face today simply weren't there. Challenges of people not having a clue or any interest whatsoever in the nature of the gospel. Um, and so I, 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 we have to recognize that we, we, are, we are needing to operate differently. And of course, most of us do recognize that, but it is a bigger shift than we probably uh, acknowledge most of the time. And the last word, no, uh, yes, the last word I'll, I'll refer to here is, is the uh, the word which I think is key to so much here, um, and again, it's a word that we can we can speak about profoundly in terms of our relationship with God, but then we struggle to speak about in terms of our relationship with one another, and that's the word trust. Uh, and uh, as I look about me in all sorts of dimensions of the life of the church. The thing that uh, I, I think probably we all stumble over um, in many different ways, you know, whether this is relationship within a parish, between parishes, between the bishop and the clergy, between this group and that group, dias, between bishops and each other. Um, the issue of trust is absolutely fundamental. And one of the questions I have is why why, when trust is at the heart of what it means to be Christian, because our trust in God and our trust in uh, the saving work of Jesus, why is our trust of one another so hard? Um, so I'm going to stop there and uh, just invite you to, uh, in your groups, which will be for 10 minutes, to uh, reflect on that kind of bigger question about what is going on with all of these, these forces, febrile responses, uh, almost polarized, polarization, what's going on there? And can we kind of look beyond that? And, uh, and, and, and perhaps you might want to reflect for a moment on the question of trust as well. I just wanted to say a little bit about how we're trying to tackle some of these issues here in Suffolk. So could I, if I could say that for a couple of minutes, and then I'm happy to work through whatever questions you think um, it, it would be helpful for me to try and explore. Uh, I'm very conscious that I've seen at least one priest from the Diocese of 
St Ed's and Ips, and I've seen one uh, lay member of Bishop's Council, so I'm going to, have to be very careful what I say. Um, <laughs> so um, we we went through an exercise, and I, I've just referred to this, uh, went through an exercise a, a, a couple of years ago, and then other other elements of it during the pandemic to explore a bit more deeply about what the 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 ministry was that the communities of Suffolk required and uh, to to ask that question as as hard and as challenging as we could um, and to ask it in a variety of contexts Uh, and it, it was out of that that there emerged a very clear and strong view that uh, we simply couldn't afford to cut the number of stipendary posts if we believed God was calling us to do all the things and engage in the communities in all the ways that uh, we have um, we believe we're called to. And uh, in in a in a peculiar way, we're just talking about this in the break. In a peculiar way. Um, that's been borne out in the pandemic, because what we've seen is clergy and laity working together, responding to a whole host of needs in their communities. And uh, yet the the clergy and laity are collaborating together on that, and often it's laity who are taking the initiative and going off uh, and embarking on new forms of provision of food or pastoral care or whatever it is. But the clergy have been the kind of, you know, the ring holders in that process. So we're committed to uh, retaining our stipendary numbers. We recognize that um, they may not be necessarily located in the right places at the moment. And then there could be some sort of shuffling around a bit. There's some unevenness in distribution, although what even this looks like, I'm not quite sure, in a largely rural diocese. I'm also very conscious that um, we we ask, particularly our rural clergy, although in some cases our urban, our town clergy, to do unbelievably huge jobs. Um, And uh, so how do we make that manageable? Now, Gavin Oldham, I knew Gavin was going to ask this question, because it's a question he always asks me. Um, but uh, Gavin's question it part, it gets to part of that, which is, you know, what are the ways in which we can try and find mechanisms to you to, to uh, relieve the burdens of administration and so forth and do things uh, in different ways or in, in perhaps the same way rather than a variety of different ways? Uh, to, uh, to try and remove that burden. And just um, I'm just doing, saying this to answer Gavin's question and, and to explain why I'm not talking about this at great length. Uh, we're, we've, we've got a project going at the moment, which Adrian Harris, who used to run the digital office at Church House, is running, um, uh, listening to and determining what sort of areas we could usefully support parishes and dioceses in by providing... Uh, shared services of one sort or another. So a, 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 a typical example would be what 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 would happen if we actually had a a, sh- a common um, bookkeeping uh, package that everybody used the same package, for example. Um, uh, so there are th- that that exercise is going on, and and that will be reporting in in the next few months. Uh, so uh, Gavin, if you can bear waiting a bit longer, I'll give you a fuller answer later. But um, we, we've been looking at how, how do we make these roles sustainable? And this goes back to the comment I made very early on about the importance of the local. And uh, certainly in rural communities, having somebody in your village who is identified as the minister or the person who is the church person, um, who is a point of reference, who uh, it keeps an eye on the the, the neighborhood and so forth that you know using the the language which we've heard before uh, in in this evening of focal minister or then I don't like the term focal because it makes the it feel that the minister is the focus which isn't of course the case so we say local minister here 
but <clears throat> building up patterns of local ministry, um, ordained and lay, to ensure that each community as best as possible, each community has someone there who is the representative, uh, the holder of, uh, of the presence of the church uh, um, with the rest of the congregation, with others, but being that person and them being a part of a team, which is led by the stipendary priest who may have 10 villages to look after, but can't be in 10 places. So that's the sort of approach we've taken here. Uh, th that it partly goes back to uh, also to Elizabeth's comment about collaboration. So that's collaboration within teams, but then looking at how we collaborate within deaneries so that we break down some of these barriers and build up some trust between parishes and benefices uh, across deaneries. And then to you know, take that a step further um, in terms of relationship with clergy and laity across the diocese. So it's a long project, but but that's the sort of direction of travel uh, with a, a really clear sense of um, being that active Christian presence in every community, uh, seeking uh, different ways in which that gets expressed, um, but uh, committed to somehow being a vehicle for the proclamation of the gospel in each place. The, 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 the one of the key piece or two, two things I'll say further about this. First of all, we haven't got a blanket plan for the whole diocese. And I think that's quite key because places vary. I mean, rural in one part of Suffolk is very different from rural in another part of Suffolk. And, uh, and at one market town isn't like another market town. So we really do have to work out what do these patterns look like locally? And we, you know, with, with some sort of basic principles, working principles, but then to have those conversations to see what, what works best. And then the, 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 so I see the question about how laity enabled. We've, we've, we've had, um, not, not in a kind of public way, but we, from, for the last few years in the diocese, there's been quite a sort of intention on the part of the bishops and the archdeacons to be permission giving uh, to clergy as well as to laity. Um, one of the things that I discovered, and I probably shouldn't say this in front of people who are in the diocese, that I discovered when I arrived here was that people were asking me questions or asking permission for doing things that had never crossed my mind needed anybody's permission. Um, so we've just tried to say, if it seems right in, in the context, you, I mean, within reason, of course, if it seems right in the context in which you are, then please, you know, you're the best judge of that. You are the best judge in you know, the clergy and laity in that place. And that that sort of disposition has seems to have in at least some places, not everywhere, seems to have engendered the same kind of quality of permission giving and receiving amongst laity too. The last thing I'd say is um, I, the, the financial model on which the Church of England currently operates is not a sustainable model, but that is not an argument in my mind for cutting clergy posts to get them to fit the amount of money you've got. The challenge I think is the other way around. How do we find other sources of income? That's what we need to be doing, not saying how do we cut the number of posts. So, so that's the approach we've taken here. And we've got a group of people, uh, including myself, looking at various uh, ways in which, and it's, it's a long haul, um, but we need to be uh, aiming to turn that around with a clear conviction that God calls people to serve in these places, in these ways, and God will, through creativity and ingenuity and inspiration, um, help us find the ways to support that. And it's not pie in the sky. I think it's, you know, it's part of our exercise of trust. So let me stop. Um, and uh, perhaps Martin yes. will uh, point me to the questions I need to answer. That's kind, Bishop. Thank you. Before I ask you the question, can I just point to the fact uh, that the Bishop Martin's uh, links are kindly in the chat room, so that's very helpful for us to pick up on those. So if you want to look to chat room, those link links are there. Um, I wonder if I could come to Anne Foreman, uh, 
and you you put a very interesting question there about 8:25 about uh, uh, what's going on. And if you want to, if you, you're unmuted. Do you want to ask that question yourself, for Bishop Martin? Thank you. Uh, well, th there wasn't a question at the end of it, but the question really is about how to counter that fear. Um, it was brought home to me by the recent elections we've got going on, and and it was clear that people. Um, uh, people from one part of the church are worried, are fearful of losing their sacramental worship. People from another part of the church are, are fearful that their attention to biblical um, to teaching and learning is, is being jeopardised. And it seems to me, having I'm not standing for Synod again, but having stood a long time ago, that we've become much more tribal. And I think that it's fear and tribalism that is not helping trust. So how, how would you counter it? Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, I think it, it, this is a really basic question, isn't it? It's an absolutely fundamental question. Um, and I, I, I th I'll, I'll give a, a brief answer, but that it, it deserves a much longer answer. So my, my, my brief response is that there, is, there are, there are short-term issues um, and there are very long term issues about uh, where where has trust gone. Um, I, the short my short term response is, I, I I think I think so long as we've got decision making processes that present uh, issues as either or, we are going to uh, increase this sense of uh, polarization, tribalism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what I hope we, we, we can somehow do is to find ways to have the conversations where first of all, we listen to each other and listen to the real concerns we have, discover what the foundation of uh, one person's particular perspective is and let them discover what our particular perspective is. And you know, if, if we believe God has called us together to be the church together, to seek in prayer and faith and trust, uh, the, the common ground which holds us together. Um, and I, I, I do think we need to find, this is a kind of a rather more ambitious thought, that we need to find a different way of making decisions that is a much more inclusive approach than the one where you always get a sense that, that the decision's been made, being made in a different room from the one that you're in. Um, so how do, we, how do we break that down? Um, I, I referred earlier to um, the fact that I seem to be on every committee that you could possibly be on at the moment uh, in, in terms of the national church operation. I still don't know where the decisions are made. Mm. Uh, it, th there is a, 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 this sort of opacity which I don't think is about deviousness at all. I think it's just that somehow we've 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 not managed to shake free uh, to enable uh, us ourselves to come together trustingly and actually listen to one another um, and give give ourselves the space to listen to one another. Um, I think one of the really good things, those of us who took part in the shared conversations, you remember a, a few years ago, some of us took part in that. Um, and there was actually space there to listen. And I think uh, some, some model of that that enables us to listen to one another might, might then discover, as I was trying to say about, you know, the save of the parish or the vision of the church, everybody's concerned about the provision of local ministry. OK, so let's have a conversation around the provision of local ministry. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful. Um, Judy, Judy Withers, would you want, do you want to come and ask uh, your question about laity and give them permission? Judy Withers. Thank you. Um, I think the bishop's already answered the question, really, because uh, he picked up on it um, while he was uh, speaking right. uh, about uh, enabling people and, and to be permission giving. So I think, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. That's great. Caroline uh, Jones, you had a question about the viability or what's what's non-viable and what's viable. Do you want to pick up on that? Yes. Well, I just think it's it, it's. I mean, I think it adds to the fear of parishes if they feel that they aren't viable, whatever that you know. And I'd just be interested, um, you know, to say how, what defines a viable parish, really. 
Um, I think there's more and more. F it, it, it's never been, in my experience, that parishes have been threatened that unless you pay your share, you won't. You will be joined up, or you won't get a priest. And this is coming in more and more. You know, into into the situation where I am, and and I find this sad because I think those clergy who are there aren't going to leave because it's generally on the understanding that it will be somehow when the, the present person leaves that you can you'll be reorganized and it's also a bit of a threat to the other other parish clergy in their deanery yeah i mean i i, th I think uh, that that that's why the work that elizabeth and i did 20 years ago where we said let's look at vitality rather than viability and how do you how do you encourage vitality i think one of the things i would love us to do is to say what would it what would it mean to put resources in to really revitalizing parishes um and then you can have the conversation where a parish itself might you know a congregation may say actually we'll be much better off if we merged with you know the congregation down the road um uh, uh which was partly actually one of the exercises that uh, Elizabeth and I were involved in the congregation, not everybody, but the congregation of the, of the, of the parish we proposed should close and merge with the neighbouring one, which was about, I don't know, 500 yards down the road. Um, uh, they, they absolutely were up for that. Um, so it's, so it's, it's kind of listening, having those conversations and listening to people and being supportive and not, as you say, wielding some uh, threat uh, that's tied into the payment of the share and we've got into an odd situation and I you know I'm guilty of it here as well an odd situation with the share where we don't see it as uh, contributing to the good of the whole we see it as uh, paying for your bit of it um, and I, I don't quite know how we get ourselves out of that but we are we are a, we have become a bit in uh, a, a situation of you, you know, you get what you pay for, rather than you pay in order that the church across the diocese can flourish. So um, that that would be my response at the moment. Thank you. That's very helpful, uh, Rosemary Waters. I wonder if you if you'd like you've got a question in there. Can I invite you to talk to Bishop Martin? Uh, yes, I was just wondering how you would. Um, advise urban areas where, to be absolutely honest, there isn't a sense of community because so many people are moving in and out all the time. So the, the church is a gathered community, but that isn't helping us to reach people outside the church. And if we go outside the church, which our parish does, um, and our presence there, the folk that we are engaging with simply don't have the resources to contribute to the parish share. So this is a, you know, it's a good mission thing, but it's not going to help us raise money. Yeah, and that, see, that's where I would, I would hope we could get to a point where we could separate out vitality from viability. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about is being vital, isn't it? I mean, that's, it's going out into your neighbourhood uh, recognizing that it's 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 a it's a different experience than it was maybe a generation ago, but going out into the neighbourhood, making contact, reaching out in one way or another, and and people perhaps even being drawn into your fellowship, but they're not going to be the people who are going to kind of cough up the five thousand a year that you need each from each person to contribute to make up the share, but then that shouldn't be the business that we're in, um, and I th I think I. It's a really hard one, but I think this is where I, I say we've got to look at alternative uh, alternative models of, of financing the operation, recognizing that you know if the church abandoned the sort of community that you're talking about, what does that say about our commitment to the poor? What does that say about our commitment to uh, the marginalized, to you know the people, the, the children of God that Jesus spent all his time with? Um, if if we do, if we find ourselves in that situation, then something has gone. I think just terribly wrong with how we are as a church. Now, um, I wouldn't report all that to the bishop. But... <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That's guy. Thank you, Rosemary, for those questions. Um, Steve Jordan, you, you've got a few questions coming in there about on finances. Is there anything you'd like to ask um, 
uh, Bishop Martin. I'm mindful of the time, but uh, would you like to come and join us and uh, ask us some questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> There's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, it, oh, it's really just to say, to me, this is all about material things and resources. And cons the only answer is consolidation, basically. I, I, I totally hear what you say, but but what you're kind of not saying is, well, what that really means is churches coming together, particularly in urban environments where there are hugely overbuilt Victorian churches too close together, never were full. And unless we as congregations accept that we aren't English heritage, we are actually out there with a mission and are willing to get together because unless you have, I think, 50 to 100 people, the administrative load on your church means you're not going to do very much outside. The vicar's going to be busy. You're not going to get people from the congregation. It's about consolidating resources. And we're too, we just don't want to do it. So can I ask you, because um, uh, my, my, my first response to that would be, th then how, how can we uh, go through a discernment process where, where, where people together can come to the view that, uh, you know, th th this church perhaps could close, but um, and we'll, we'll go together with that one. Do you see that as a process or, or does this have to be some sort of imposed solution? People have to come to the belief that that is a possibility and are open to it. it, it top down is all is very difficult and just leads to more resistance. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be an acceptance by congregations that they can't do what they should be doing unless they have more resources. And that will only come by getting together with other congregations and growing from that point. Yes, I can, I can see that, but it, so it is, it is a, it's a discernment process that everybody has to be part of. Yeah. Um, I, I, so here I mean, I give a slightly different answer in the rural communities where mm. I and mean, here we've got 479, I think it is 479 or 478 uh, church buildings and 90% of them are grade one or two star listed medieval buildings. Um, and they are uh, key buildings in a village, even though uh, they may not attract uh, significant congregations. Although interestingly, rural rural congregations are often 5% of the population, or you can find 10% of the population of that village on the uh, electoral roll or more. So proportionally, they, they are significant, but sustaining the buildings is a real challenge. And yet the buildings play that, and we were discovered in the pandemic, a, a number of uh, places across the county, and I know elsewhere, when the churches were closed, that period they were closed, they suddenly discovered the people who, in their village would actually go into the church during the day that they never realized were going in there. Um, and I, that, that has underlined for me the importance of keeping them open and the importance of uh, the building in, in, in every place. But again, we need a different solution for maintaining the buildings. And you know, it's one of the things we're trying to look at here in Suffolk. Um, uh, and I'm, I am very reluctant to close any buildings. There's no building that I'm aware of that's on any list for closure in Suffolk. Um, we've got plenty that uh, have decided or probably will decide to become the so-called festival churches where they have fewer services. But I was listening to a priest this morning who was telling me that, that, um, that one, one festival church uh, one church that had become a festival church, the, 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 the two ladies that were left in the congregation decided that they would make a good go of harvest. Um, and so they got a quite, a, quite a crew from the village to harvest. Then they decided that maybe they'd start services back up again. Um, and now they've got a regular congregation once a month. 
so so there's there is a there's a kind of cycle here that we have to recognize and uh, uh, so keep keeping them available open even if reduced use um, is I think is crucial, but we need to find another solution for maintaining the buildings. Yeah, I, I think that the urban and rural are different problems. Yeah. Yeah. And I take your point completely about the Victorian overbuilding. See, thank you, Angie. Uh, Bishop, I'm mindful of the time. David Lamming, you've got a question. I wonder if we might let, make this the last question. He can ask me this. He can ask me his question at Bishop's Council tomorrow. Okay, right. Well, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. <laughs> let him ask it. Let him ask it. Let him well, ask it. You're, you're getting information to ask it twice here in this forum and then tomorrow at Bishop's Council. Go on, off you go. Thank you. I think it's more a matter of whether others will be interested to, to hear um, Martin's views about it. Um, we focused, Martin, on, question, on issues about focal or local ministry and the concern to try and establish a local minister in every parish and, and to sort of build up the church from there, whether that local minister be ordained or lay. But I think one of the problems that we've got in rural areas, as you're very much aware, is the reluctance of people to travel to another church in the same benefice, even if it's only two miles down the road. And as I've Put on the chat as one former rector in my benefit said uh, many years ago now when he was asked how he would manage he said well they're all nearer than Tesco and everybody jumps in their car to go to Tesco but they're not prepared to go two miles down the road or less to worship in another church so what what do we need to do to encourage people to accept uh, a local or focal minister who's not necessarily the the rector or vicar who they would expect to be leading worship or leading the church in their particular village. So I think I think there are a couple of couple of questions there, David, and let me just uh, answer them uh, briefly. I mean, first of all, you've pointed out that that you know just how important the local is and how in terms of and it's a spiritual importance, isn't it? I mean, I you know I I I. I what want to challenge it and yet i also recognize the value the, the the profound value of this and in fact the experience that we've had during zoom services and other online services where suddenly people have discovered their neighbors in another village and realize that as somebody put it they haven't got two heads and uh we, we perhaps we could spend time together so so i've we're getting shifts in that pattern uh more shifts again through the the pandemic I think the, 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 the question of um, uh, how, how a, a local minister is accepted, uh, it depends, depends in, my, in my experience on, if you like, the quality of that, you know, what they, what they provide. If they are there offering pastoral care, if they are there uh, as a as an active presence as a as a Christian witness in that community, then people will come to see that they are uh, the the person who they can turn to that they can accept. And I think, you know, David, I can point you to some uh, uh, deaneries across um, Suffolk where that process has happened, um, particularly. And I know this is about ordained, but particularly through our our pattern of um, uh, we've got an internal diocesan ordination pathway. Um, so ordaining local people who are going to serve in their local community. Um, we do the discernment and the training internally. And, uh, and that has uh, raised up about 50 new priests um, who are serving their local community. Um, and they are accepted and doing extraordinary things in their village contexts. Um, I, I can tell you more later, David. Mr. Martin, thank you very much. That's very helpful, uh, David. Thank you. Thank you all, for all your questions. Um, they will stay in the chat room and we'll record those. And if there's anything else that, that Bishop Martin wants to pick up on, uh, we can do so. But I'm mindful of the time uh, and try to be prompt and keep us all together. So I want to say thank you very much indeed for all for joining us this evening. But a very special thanks to Bishop Martin for giving up 
uh, at the evening this evening. We've, we've had a, a wonderful evening, and the fact that so many questions have come forward, you've initiated lots of thinking. So we're really very, very grateful to you for that. Richard Martin, would you like to, to finish us off this evening with, with a close us tonight with a final prayer of blessing? So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the calling that you place on each one of us and uh, the calling of the communities in which we serve. We ask you to bless those places where we seek to live out our Christian faith in whatever way that is that we believe you are calling us to do. And we ask that we trust you for the provision that we need in order to carry out that which you are calling us to and we ask you that you bless each one of us and those places where we live and serve in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen <laughs>